In this video, we're going to talk about respiratory systems. We're going to talk about all kinds of different respiratory systems first, or sort of how animals in general exchange their gases. Uh, we're going to talk about mammalian respiratory anatomy in particular, and then I want to end by talking about how nonpolar carbon dioxide is carried in the blood and sort of the consequences of that for pH balance in the blood. So um, for all organisms, in order to exchange gases, the, the exchange surface must be somewhat wet. And so um, that's going to be pretty easy for things like aquatic animals. Um, they're going to be able to have water um, all throughout anyway. And so the, the gills of fish, for example, are very watery at the point where they're near the capillaries. Um, for land animals, that's going to be a bit more of a challenge. But different animals have different respiratory surfaces. Um, for some animals, like earthworms, they can just keep their skin moist, and so their skin is actually their respiratory surface, but then they have to keep it wet enough to be able to um, stay alive because some of it's going to evaporate into the drier air around them. And um, certainly uh, things like amphibians also have a respiratory surface on their skin. Now they also have lungs, but they're not quite as well developed as that of, say, reptiles or mammals or birds. What we've decided to do in our evolutionary history is not have wet skin, not um, um, secrete water to keep the entire epidermis moist. And so um, that enables reptiles and mammals and birds perhaps to live further on drier land, um, places where amphibians can't live. Um, and we're going to instead just rely upon our lungs um, and sort of deep inside of our lungs it's still wet in order to respire. Um, but um, maybe we're not losing quite as much water. Um, every time we breathe out we are still um, um, losing a bit of that water. Um, but um, overall we're able to live in a drier place. So this is kind of uh, maybe um, one tiny little piece of the end of the breathing tube in our lungs. And I'm just trying to, to say early on we're going to call this an alveolus um, later in the in the presentation and I just want you to notice um, that um, they don't draw it here but um, there's sort of this layer of wetness in the inside of this uh, uh, air space where the air is pulled down um, and so uh, a respiratory surface has to be wet because the gases have to dissolve into that wet um, water first and then they can diffuse into the bloodstream itself. All right, um, I want to take a little bit of an opportunity to talk about aquatic animals and the challenge they face first. Um, it is true that they, they have water all around them, so they don't have to worry about drying out as much, but they have a much greater challenge obtaining gases because gases like O2 are nonpolar. And remember that nonpolar things don't dissolve very well in water that is polar. So there's generally a much lower concentration of oxygen gas in bodies of water than there are on land with the air around us. So I just want you to imagine that uh, the, uh, the respiratory systems of aquatic animals have to be very well fashioned to pull as much oxygen as they can out of the water that's making contact with their respiratory organs. And so I just want to give the, um, uh, I want to talk briefly about the fish gills as being an example of a broader concept called countercurrent exchange. Um, and, and I'll talk about what that means. Um, so this is just one example of countercurrent exchange, and there are many transport systems and other animals that take advantage of this as well. Um, but we're going to see that it's really important that aquatic animals do this in order to maximize um, um, getting as much oxygen into the blood as possible. So what is a countercurrent system? A countercurrent system is simply this idea. We want the flow of water through the gills to go one way, and we want the blood coming in to be oxygenated to be flowing the opposite way. So we want the two currents, we want the two liquids to be flowing counter to each other. So in this little diagram up here, um, I want you to imagine that this top um, liquid is perhaps the water flowing through the gills. Um, maybe it makes sense that it starts off with about 100% oxygen in it, or it's going to have as much oxygen as it has. And then as it exits the gills, maybe um, as much of the oxygen has left as possible. Um, and, and this bottom row then would be the blood. Um, so I want you to imagine that at first entering the gills, it would have very little oxygen in it, because remember, we're sending blood to the respiratory organs to be oxygenated, and that as it leaves, maybe it's picked up a lot of oxygen. 
So the reason we um, the the reason why this counter current idea is so efficient is that um, anywhere that you think of the water being close to the blood, in any area throughout this entire respiratory um, exchange, the water's oxygen levels are going to be slightly higher than that of the blood's. Um, so um, what's neat about that is that if there's always slightly more oxygen in the water than in the blood, then there's always going to be this concentration gradient throughout the entire system where oxygen is always going to be moving from higher to lower concentration. Even though there's less and less oxygen as water moves this way, there's still a little bit more oxygen here than the um, than in the blood where where uh, blood is just coming in. So there's still diffusion of oxygen from high to low concentration. And the net effect of these two systems um, being next to each other across the entire distance of the respiratory organ is that we can actually concentrate oxygen in the blood very highly even though passive transport is occurring the entire time. So let me just show you kind of the opposite example. What if we had blood flow and water flow going in the same direction? So um, I'm sorry that this picture does this, but now I want you to imagine that the water flow is down here, starting off at 100 and heading this way, and maybe the blood is also coming in this way and heading that way as well. Um, so at first, there would be a tremendous difference in concentration, maybe 100 versus zero, and so there would be initially a tremendous rush of oxygen from high to low concentration, but I hope you'd appreciate that that gradient gets less and less as time as, as the as the flow progresses toward the right, and eventually you'd reach this dynamic equilibrium. And at dynamic equilibrium, there would no longer be a gradient. There would no longer be a flow of additional oxygen from the water toward the blood. And maybe if we had this concurrent flow, if we had them flow in the same direction, maybe only about 50% of the oxygen would cross. So again, this kind of countercurrent system, still relying on passive transport, fully oxygenates the blood because if we have them travel in different directions, there's always a gradient going from the water toward the blood. So a very efficient system, and I just want you to appreciate that this makes sense, that such an efficient system would evolve in such a place of need like aquatic bodies of water. So let's talk about our own anatomy now. Let's switch to mammals and let's think about how we get fresh air down to our exchange surfaces. Um, the place where, where air actually, uh, oxygen actually crosses into our blood is sort of deep inside of our lungs. So again, that, that prevents a lot of water loss. Um, um, to keep those surfaces wet, the only way water can escape is through our nose and mouth. Um, but the problem is, um, if we don't have a way of pulling fresh air constantly down to that area, um, there won't be very much oxygen left to enter the blood. And so how do we actually pull fresh air down to our um, air exchange um, areas? Um, so we have a muscle called the diaphragm kind of at the bottom of our chest cavity. Um, and that's simply a muscle that when it contracts when we breathe in, it pulls down. We also technically have muscles in our ribs that, that kind of um, contract to expand the chest cavity out. And both of those have the net effect of making the space inside of our chest bigger. Um, this is important because if you remember your gas laws from chemistry, remember that PV equals nRT. Um, we're going to argue in this case that the right side of the equation is really staying constant. Temperature of the gases inside isn't going to change, um, and there's however much gas is kind of in there at any given moment. Um, so all of this is constant then um, if the volume massively increases, the pressure inside must decrease so that this equation stays equal on both sides. If we greatly increase the volume of space inside, the pressure falls dramatically in there, then air will flow from high to low pressure. We, we create this very low pressure inside. Atmospheric pressure will actually be higher. So by making the volume of our chest bigger, um, we actually pull air down. And then when we breathe out, we do the exact opposite, where um, the, the diaphragm relaxes, the volume decreases inside of the chest. Um, with all that air in there, it actually creates a high pressure, and so air is pushed back out.
So it's actually this muscle action that pulls air in and pushes air back out. So that's how you breathe. Notice that your breathing tube here um, starts off. You can either breathe through your nose or your mouth. It quickly kind of merges into one breathing tube. And then like every transport system we've seen thus far, we see this respiratory system branch and branch and branch and branch. And actually inside of your lungs are millions of these little um, um, cul-de-sacs essentially. Um, so with every muscular um, action of your diaphragm, some air is pulled um, to all these little cul-de-sacs. Um, that's, uh, I want to say, the functional unit of the respiratory system. That, that would be one alveolus, um, and plural would be the alveoli. Um, so some air is sent to all the alveoli, and um, if the muscle action brings it there, then um, the whole purpose of this little um, grape-like structure is that it maximizes the surface area to volume ratio. Um, this is actually a very tiny little cluster, so small volume inside, high surface area for the capillaries to wrap around. And what, act, what, what the, the purpose of all this is, is the actual distance that oxygen has to diffuse to get into your blood after being pulled there by muscle action is just a tiny little distance. It's a mere micrometers away from a capillary. So here's another diagram of that. Um, here is the muscle action pulling fresh air to um, the alveolus, and then the oxygen gas will simply diffuse through simple diffusion. Remember that it's a nonpolar molecule, so it can go right through the phospholipid bilayer of cells, and it will eventually make its way to a red blood cell. High to low concentration coming in, and the carbon dioxide will also just be able to go from high to low concentration going out. So um, everything here in terms of gas exchange, again, is just simple passive transport. Um, so the last little conversation we want to have is I just want to talk about how carbon dioxide is carried in the blood. Remember that the body cells are constantly producing it as a byproduct of cellular respiration. So we're going to want to get rid of it by transporting it to the lungs and letting it diffuse into the alveoli to be pushed out when you exhale. Um, but carbon dioxide, just like oxygen, is nonpolar overall, so it doesn't dissolve in polar water very well. So we're going to have to carry it just like we carry oxygen. Um, as it turns out, hemoglobin, the same carrier protein that can carry oxygen, can also carry some carbon dioxide. So uh, a not insignificant percentage of carbon dioxide is carried as hemoglo in, in hemoglobin or sort of on hemoglobin. Um, but the vast majority of carbon dioxide diffuses into red blood cells. And there's another enzyme in there. I'm not going to name it because I don't really care. Um, and that enzyme can take the carbon dioxide gas and water and combine them to form carbonic acid, H2CO3. I don't need you to memorize that name, but what's neat about carbonic acid is that it can, um, in equilibrium, also release um, an acid, um, release H+, and form this HCO3-. minus. I want you to know the name of HCO3 minus. Its name is bicarbonate. And the, what I really want you to appreciate is that's how the vast majority of carbon dioxide is carried. It's carried as bicarbonate ion in your blood. And I just want you to notice that that HCO3 is fully charged. It has a full minus. And that's what makes it dissolve in water so well. So this is how we carry carbon dioxide until it gets to the lungs. And I just also want you to see also from this equation that um, what this equation is really telling us is that um, carbon dioxide concentration is really directly proportional with acid levels in our blood. In other words, this is going to be a very simple way that your body can maintain blood pH, um, something that's very important for keeping enzymes working, as we discussed before. So um, if there's some other th process in your body that's maybe making um, a lot of acid, um, how can you prevent the blood from getting too acidic? Well, a simple way that your body can compensate in the short term is just to increase your breathing rate. If you increase the breathing rate, then you'll get rid of more CO2. And if you get rid of more CO2, you'll get rid of more H plus ions um, because the equilibrium in this equation will shift back to the left as more carbon dioxide is, is decreasing. And so you can get, you can sort of raise your blood pH by breathing harder and faster um, and also vice versa. So I just kind of want you to appreciate the, the, the general idea that um, this is one of the first 
um, ideas of how your body maintains overall homeostasis. You can maintain blood pH homeostasis with your breathing rate by controlling how much CO2 is in your blood. Okay, so we've um, covered the respiratory system. We've talked about how animals exchange gases in general. Um, we eventually focused um, on, the, our, on our own respiratory anatomy, and we finished by talking about how carbon dioxide, a nonpolar molecule, is carried in the blood.